this week on the Back Table Podcast. You know, again, I think to get better buy-in, it's better to be honest with patients. And I tell them, I'm like, listen, this is not cancer. You don't have to have this done. And the other way that I explain my practice to patients is I tell them that I'm not a quantity of life doctor, I'm a quality of life doctor. So this is not going to extend your life, but it's going to make you enjoy eating and enjoy going out to dinner and enjoy being around company rather than becoming fearful that you're going to choke. So I think when you phrase it in that way, I think patients are a little bit more open too. Even when they come in thinking like, I'm just going to hear it, but I don't, you know, I'm not interested. But I think if you phrase it in a way that is more palatable, then it's an easier conversation. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Back Table ENT podcast. We're a podcast that focuses on all things otolaryngology, and we've got a really great show for you today. Thanks for stopping by. Now a quick word from our sponsor. Cook Medical's otolaryngology head and neck surgery clinical specialty strives to provide otolaryngologists with minimally invasive solutions to address unmet needs. Areas of focus include head and neck, otology, and laryngology, with products ranging from a full suite of interventional silendoscopy products and the Doppler blood flow monitoring system to the biodesign otologic repair graft and the Hercules 100 transnasal esophageal balloon. For more information, visit cookmedical.com forward slash otolaryngology. Now, back to the show. Our guest today is Dr. Rebecca J. Howell. She's an associate professor of otolaryngology and division chief of laryngology at University of Cincinnati. She is a clinician researcher with a particular interest in the intersection of voice and swallowing disorders. And she's here today to talk to us about the management of Zinker's diverticula. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. How are you? Thank you, Ashley. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Before we get into it, tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice and how you got to this point in your career. Oh, I appreciate that. You know, like so many different people, I think I dabbled in a little bit of everything and then fell in love with the airway. So the the intersection, again, of voice and swallowing. And so at the glottic level, I think is the very interesting part of swallowing disorders in particular for me. I came to Cincinnati because my late partner, Sid Kosla, did not do in-office procedures. He also didn't do a whole lot in the swallowing or dysphagia world. And so I was brought here specifically to grow that program. Since then, we have added a couple more partners. I now have Aaron Friedman and Greg Dion who have joined me at University of Cincinnati. And we have a very robust voice swallowing and airway program. And it's been a lot of fun to build and to grow. I have 10 phenomenal speech language pathologists that also have like really helped me to evolve in my understanding of swallowing disorders, especially, but also for for voice and, and airway. They are just phenomenal people, and I couldn't thank them more. That's awesome. And you start a fellowship too, right? Right. We have our first fellow starting this summer. So we have an international fellow that's starting in July, and we are currently interviewing for our fellowship for 2024 already. So You know, everything in uh, education and medicine takes forever. So these have been like years in the work. So it's finally coming into fruition. It's really exciting. It's going to be a lot of fun to actually have somebody that we get to put our imprint on. Yeah, congrats. That's awesome. That's really exciting. Thank you. So we're going to talk about Zinker's diverticulum. Maybe before we get into patient presentation and how you take care of these patients, maybe just some definitions like for our listeners who maybe are a little rusty or don't know what our Zinker's diverticulum is. Can you talk about that? Sure. Zinker's diverticulum is a specific diagnosis of a swallowing disorder. So it is one that causes in the upper esophagus, it's an outpouching. It's an abnormal outpouching of the esophagus that causes specific symptoms. They uh, arise typically in patients that are in their seventh decade. They're not usually seen in younger patients. It's a red flag if they are, but it causes problems with both swallowing, but more specifically with regurgitation of food. So regurgitation of food or pills, I think, is even more specific to this particular thing. Yeah, I feel like when I think of zinkers, like it's always that classic like regurgitation of, you know, undigested food or regurgitation of pills. And you're like, oh, wait a minute, could this be a zinkers diverticulum? Exactly. Being a a zinkers diverticulum as opposed to other types of diverticular or outpouchings, that's related to its location. Is that right? That's right. That's right. That's actually, it's a really important point. So one of the first papers that 
our pouch collaborative designed was actually looking at the different types and flavors of upper esophageal diverticulate. Zankers is by far the most common, by far. But you can also get a Killian Jameson, you can get a Lemire's, you can also get iatrogenic. So I think one of the things that I always talk to my residents about, especially, is if there are any neck incisions, just double check your imaging before, you know, believing that it's truly a Zankers diverticulum, because a lot of times, especially they're in C spine, you can actually get what's called a traction diverticulum. So a traction diverticulum means that that outpouching is caused because there's some scar tissue, which actually kind of pulls on the esophagus and then pulls out all three layers. Whereas a Zankers diverticulum is really just the herniation of the mucosa. And so this actually goes through what's called the Killian Jameson's triangle. So it's the upper esophageal segment, but between the fibers of the cricopharyngeus muscle and the inferior constrictors. So it's a, a triangle that actually is a congenital dehiscence. And so how we like to think about these things, especially in, in Zankers, is that you have to have a CP or cricopharyngeus muscle dysfunction and a congenital dehiscence of this area. So if you just have one, then you have an obstructive CPMD, which in fact causes, in some cases in our, in our early study, actually caused more symptoms. Their EAT-10 scores, so an EAT-10 is a, is a patient-reported outcome measure that's a validated instrument that we use. And they actually do worse. So in some ways, if you are lucky enough to have one of these dehiscents, your symptoms are probably prolonged. So you've had them, and that's that's pretty common. Patients will present when you actually ask them when, you know, if they've had swallowing problems or if you ask their family members, it's usually between one and three years. So the symptoms come on, you know, kind of slowly and gradually. But there's probably some point that then the regurgitation symptoms and the actual food and the pills that come up and I think that's really what kind of sends them into to the office. And that makes sense, right? Because in my mind, correct me if I'm wrong, the upper esophageal sphincter is not relaxing. And so when you're pushing that food bolus back, there's that area of weakness. And so that's just getting kind of the pressure there kind of pushes into that. And then over time, that basically a pouch develops there. Is that kind of how to think of it? You're absolutely right. So, I, you know, and I explained to patients that, that the esophagus, I mean, it's all plumbing, right? So I draw these very funny pictures for them of like <laughs> lips, a straight tube, and then some like wiggly lines that is the rest of the <laughs> intestines. So it's all plumbing. So if, you know, if you have a backup somewhere, then you're going to have symptoms above. And so, you know, so sometimes, and again, what I think will really be interesting in the long term as we like learn more and more about these patients, I think that the lower esophagus is probably affecting the upper esophagus. So one of the things that, that again, I think, in thinking of these Zinkers patients, sometimes they come with like a what people will look at as a CP bar, right? So a CP bar, a cricopharyngeus bar, is a radiologic finding, which shows 50%. This is from Ekberg and Olson, and they found that if you have a 50% reduction in the diameter, then it's called a CP bar, which is simply a radiologic finding. It's not a diagnosis. You have to actually have dysphagia symptoms then to say that you have a cricopharyngeus muscle dysfunction. And so that's important because if you look at the lower esophagus, sometimes that muscle becomes tighter or that valve becomes tighter because you have really bad acid reflux or you have really bad dysmotility or you have a mega esophagus or nutcracker esophagus, something, right? You have some other dysmotility that's lower down that's actually causing your body to tighten up that valve so that you're not refluxing all the time. So, you know, the CP muscle, I think, in the upper esophageal sphincter it's a tricky muscle because it's not always just as it seems. Hmm. Yeah, that can make it really, really tricky to kind of figure out what's going on. So you talked a little bit about the demographics of these patients. So tend to be older, maybe in their 70s. What's a typical patient that's coming to see you in your office? Maybe somebody who hasn't had the workup yet, because I'm sure as the subspecialist, you probably get patients who are kind of like already worked up. But Let's say that you don't know what's going on and they're just coming in with dysphagia. What other things are key to be asking? Yeah, that's a great question, Ashley. I think so. Any patient that comes in with a swallowing problem, I certainly think that a flexible laryngoscopy is very helpful. Sometimes a stroboscopy if you're looking for closure, because again, these patients are usually a little bit older. So sometimes that can be beneficial just for, again, the glottic closure. But I think it's important. So even when you just look with a scope, one of the things that you'll notice or that I, I teach my residents to look at is just 
you know, saliva or mucus, like pooling of secretions, right? So if you see a clean throat with absolutely nothing else compared to somebody who is, you know, full of spit, you know already that they've got a problem, right? They've got a swallowing problem. The thing that is unique to Zankers, um, and I believe it was Marathi that actually wrote this up several years ago, is he called it the rising tide. And so one of the things that you will oftentimes see is this like frothy secretions coming up, up out of the UES, especially as they voice. So as patients continue, I have them talk for a while. Sometimes we have them do some high-pitched ease or some glides because as they keep going, oftentimes you'll get this like rising frothy secretions that come out of the, you then see in the piriform sinus more often on the left than the right, which is also consistent with, you know, oftentimes when we see zinkers, they're posteriorly oriented, but oftentimes they'll, they look or appear that they're on the left side. And that's just, just due to the anatomy of the trachea, this ophageal groove. And so that rising tide finding, that's specific for zinkers, or that could be in, you know, other forms of dysphagia, other pathologies that cause dysphagia as well? It's a good question. You know, it hasn't been studied enough to be able to say whether it is, but I, I would say it definitely is a sign that the upper esophageal sphincter is not working properly. Most often, I would say it's in diverticular patients, but I mean, it's a sign that the UES is not properly opening and allowing that, you know, just normal secretions and saliva to go down. So I think that that one's a very useful one. The other ones that, again, are the patient reported outcome measures. So we use like the eating assessment tool 10. We use the reflux symptom index. We use the, the voice handicapped index 10 and the glottal function index as sort of just basic metrics to be able to take upon when patients come in. You know, as far as gender predilection, there's a slight increase in men compared to women, but really it's pretty even. It's not statistically significant. We talked about age, some of the other factors that we looked at, but really we haven't found anything clinically significant. We've looked at, you know, as part of the pouch collaborative, we looked at MS, we've looked at ALS, neurologic conditions, stroke conditions as other sort of predictors of this. The other thing that we really looked at was weight loss. We looked at aspiration pneumonia, and none of it was clinically significant. And what that the Pouch Collaborative is a dysphagia interest group of physicians, researchers, and surgeons. It started in 2017. It's a big red cap database. So it's a prospectively collected database of patients with CPMD, early zankers. But they can be with or without a pouch. And then it also, it can be with or without surgery. So I think that's a really important piece as we move forward to be able to tell patients this is actually, as I said, one to three years is usually where they present. So it's not something that they have to hurry up and get done. But on the other hand, if they're already older, they're probably not getting any healthier in a couple of years. So it's really kind of a balance in how bad their symptoms are and their surgical risks. So you're saying that Zinker's patients are not more likely to have weight loss or aspiration pneumonia or, you know, those other things that you looked at? No. I mean, those are things that I think we tell people. And this is this is really why I designed this REDCAP database was to actually look at it. Like the things that we tell patients and then what's actually true, it's not to say that they're zero, but it's a small minority that come in and actually present with like a feeding tube or, you know, weight loss or aspiration pneumonia. It's like that is sort of how I think of end stage dysphagia. Most of them present well before that. Not to say that they maybe couldn't get to that point at some point, but that's not usually when, when they show up in the office. So is it maybe one of these things where when it was first described, patients presented so late that they did have all of those findings, but now we catch it earlier, maybe. It's probably true. You know, these were originally written by von Zanker, by Ludlow. It was in the 18th century. So when we first, like, really kind of, like, wrote these things up and actually thought about it, I mean, yeah, they probably were doing terrible by then, right? We didn't yeah. have <laughs> Now we have access to medicine. It's just a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's a lot simpler. And then we haven't gotten into like the differences between open and endoscopic, but really as like endoscopic kind of took off like in the 80s, that's really when I think this even became kind of more of a known diagnosis, I guess. We started looking for it a little bit more, I think. Right. Well, when you're talking to these patients, is there anything that's important to ask during that history taking? You mentioned asking about maybe surgery, so like an ACDF. Have you had any surgery on your cervical spine? Because that might make us, you know, more concerned that there's some sort of traction diverticula. Are there other like specific questions that are kind of outside of your normal questioning that you always want to make sure you ask these patients in particular? 
what I think, and it, I think it helps more for your relationship with the patient and sort of having them understand that you know this disease is the time frame. So what brought them in this time? So as I said, I mean, most of them have had problems from one to three years. So in reality, like there's something that kind of started or changed in their presentation that that made them finally come in, right? So I think that's usually what I think. I think that that's important because that gets to the motivation of the patient, whether they want to do something or not. So if they say, my husband made me come in here, they're not ready for surgery, right? But if they say, oh, you know, I had this choking episode or like, I really hate it when like pills come up the next day. Those patients are usually much more open to, okay, well, what if or what could you do? So I think it's important just for, again, patient-physician relationship more than, you know, red flags. I think, again, knowing your anatomy, looking at your imaging is really, really important. And then, again, next scars, asking at least about neurologic diseases. I think while they're not common enough or not as common in, in most patients that have as anchors, still good to know because, you know, again, we'll see down the road if they actually do worse, don't do as well, et cetera. Yeah, that makes sense. And so you talked a little bit about the exam earlier with the scope exam and being able to see those pooling of secretions. And so there's no real way to see the pouch on a clinic exam, correct? It's beyond what we can see with a scope. Correct. With a normal flexible laryngoscopy, yeah. One could argue you could use a transnasal esophagoscopy in the office. But honestly, in, in reality, I think most gastroenterologists will actually not see these. And probably us as ENTs, we might not too. Because the upper esophagus, you know, in that post cricoid space, it's so sensitive. So you really have to like go quickly past there because that's that gag reflux, right? So I think they're usually missed on endoscopy, especially if they're small. Now, if they're giant, then yes, of course, you're going to see them. And by giant, you know, I mean probably greater than three. Our categories, they weren't ideal, but we did categories of less than one, one to two, three to four, five to six or more. So again, once you're getting into the the three to four category, then you probably would see it on most endoscopies. That's interesting. So that means if a patient comes to you and they're like, oh, yeah, I, I had an EGD, I had an upper endoscopy, it was fine. They may still have a zincers that just wasn't seen. Absolutely. And again, admittedly, because I'm a specialist and this is the group of patients that I love to see, I do get that history a lot. You know, it's fairly common. Again, it just is. It's not a bad thing. It's not a misdiagnosis. It just is. So to be honest, I mean, for most patients, I do a fair amount of transnasal esophagoscopy in the, in the office, but I usually order a swallow study first just because, again, you could miss muscular issues. You can miss certainly dysmotilities. I mean, HRM um, manometry is the better test for that. And again, that's, it's more in the research field right now from a Zanker's perspective. But I think there'll be more to come, and I think it'll give us a better understanding of why people develop these in the first place, why they get the CPMD. Because the pouch, I guess if it's not full of food, it's kind of collapsed anyway, right? And so it could be really easy to not see that space if it's it's kind of a potential space if it's not full of anything. Yeah, exactly. It's like a collapsible balloon. And that's kind of how I describe it to patients in the office, particularly when they come in and they're like, well, I had an EGD and it didn't show anything. But you can't always see it if you don't put enough insufflation. So insufflation of air or in this case, you know, barium, then you can actually see these things. But yeah, otherwise it's quite easy to miss. Yeah. And so moving on to the imaging, you mentioned barium swallow studies. Do you like to get a modified barium swallow study or, or I guess video fluoroscopy, whichever term you prefer? There's probably other names of it as well. But I feel like I usually get that one because it also tells me more about other swallowing types. You know, if it's not as inkers, maybe it tells me more about the patient's swallow in general. Whereas, you know, an x-ray esophagram really is just kind of a picture of the outline of the esophagus with barium in it. How do you think of it? I think you've hit it on the head. You know, swallowing imaging in general, we have a lot of work to do there. I think that there's a lot of opportunities there to be able to really understand it and to do it better. So as part of the the database, we use an esophagram. The reason for that is because, again, looking for lower esophageal issues and because it's widely accessible. It's widely accessible. It's fairly standardized across the nation. So that's why we chose the barium esophagram. But it's not because I think it's the best tool from an outcomes perspective. I think it's a good thing just to be able to kind of rule in, rule out, get a better sense of like what, again, the lower esophageal function is. But I think you're right. I think the modified barium swallower video fluoroscopy gives you much better detail 
of the UES and the pharyngeal components. But again, the, the challenge there is it's still not truly standardized. I mean, if you do the MBS IMP protocol, it is, but even within like our own, our university is finally standardized, finally, but my community partners, they're still not. So it's not uncommon to, and I'm sure you've seen this too, Ashley, like you'll get a report back that says no aspiration or penetration and that's all you get. And I've had conversations with my radiology colleagues and I've told them like, I already know if they're aspirating. I don't need you to tell me that. I need you to tell me how to stop it. That's where I think modified barium swallows really or video fluoroscopy changes how we think about patients. And again, from my speech pathology colleagues, we work very closely, but it gives you a better sense of what's actually happening in the rest of the pharynx. Is the limitation just the availability of a speech language pathologist to do it? I know at our institution that the speech therapists are the ones who do the modified barium swallows. So does not everybody have the, the personnel to be able to do it or the expertise? You know, I think it's a good question. I would assume that most hospitals would have a speech pathologist that's at least, you know, on board. So there are state to state laws on who has to read these and who has to be in the room. We just found this out because I just got my credentials for video fluoroscopy at UC. So in the state of Ohio, a physician has to be in the room. It can't be an APP, it can't be anybody else. So for the actual like start and stop of the machine, it has to be a physician. It has to be a licensed provider, a licensed physician. And so, yes, a speech pathologist has to be there, but you also have to have, you know, again, this is state to state. State to state, it is a different algorithm. But again, it's still not a standardized test. You know, sometimes you'll get one swallow. Sometimes you'll get one thin and one cookie. It just really depends. It's just not, it's not a true standardized practice. So I think we are evolving in that direction and hopefully we'll get there, you know, sooner than later. But I think that there's still a huge amount of discrepancy in the video fluoroscopy. But I do think that, you know, and to your point, I think it's probably a much better outcome metric. So the Davis group had written about the PCR, the pharyngeal constriction ratio. And I think that that probably is a better metric of, you know, how open open or closed, if you will, the UES becomes, particularly after surgical treatment. Manometry might be a really interesting one, too, because I think, like you're saying, I think that the pharynx also has a component, too. And so really having a better understanding of the different pressure differentials from the pharynx to the UES to the esophagus, I think will really, in the future, I think, guide us a little bit more towards which patients need what types of surgery. Yeah, so there's still a lot of potential in that area, it sounds like. And so once you get your imaging and you are able to see that it does appear that there's a zinker's diverticulum there, can you describe a little bit about what you're seeing, what that looks like? I feel like it's always really ripe for tests, you know, because it's the classic picture. You'll kind of see that outline of the pouch. Any other things that you're looking for when you see that? Or is it pretty much just like, aha, there it is. Like, let's, you know, talk about what we need to do now. So again, I look for hardware, any sort of hardware that's on the spine. And then the other thing, I think you always need an AP and a lateral view. So whichever test you're looking at, I think you need both. So it depends on how big they are. Sometimes you can actually miss them on a lateral. So if it's really big, then it just kind of obscures the whole thing. And then all of a sudden you switch them to an AP and you realize, oh, this is coming off the side. The other thing is you can also tell a Killian Jameson. Killian Jamesons usually are more narrow necked and they're below the cricopharyngeus muscle, which is different from a Zanker. So a Zanker is going to always be above the CP muscle. So those are the things that I look for. So an AP, a lateral, and then if there's any, you know, again, hardware, and again, I always look at the secondary esophageal. So do they have a giant hiatal hernia? Do they have a paraesophageal? I've had a couple people now that have had giant paraesophageal hernias that, as expected, you operate on their zankers. Some of their symptoms get better. The regurgitation does, but they still have swallowing problems. And then you go and get their hiatal hernia and they feel like a million bucks. Have you looked at um, the incidence of reflux? Do most of these patients have heartburn reflux problems too? We did. I think, you know, one of the challenges, and you guys did a great podcast uh, on LPR, there are a lot of challenges. There's a lot of challenges in what reflux is, right? So the majority of patients do say that they have had a history of reflux. But, you know, I'll be honest, Ashley, I have a history of reflux too. So I'm not sure that it's super <laughs> specific to anyone. <laughs> you know, and I also tell patients, I say, you know, if I if I overate and had, you know, a margarita and a burrito, like I'll get it reflux. So like it's not <laughs> super specific. So, but yes, I do think most of them, they do say that they have had a history of some sort of reflux. But I think that's the challenge just, you know, for us as clinicians too, is like 
sometimes I, I think the pendulum has swung far in the other direction, you know. And then the other thing is even, again, to our colleagues in, in gastroenterology, I mean, you know, sometimes I'll send patients for an evaluation for reflux and they send them back with a, a, an EGD that says they don't see reflux. Well, that's not the test. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's not the test for reflux. That's like me telling people, <laughs> looking at a laryngoscopy and saying you have reflux, right? You have signs of reflux, but you don't have a diagnosis of reflux. You have signs. You have signs. I'm suspicious you have it. You have signs of acid reflux, right? You know, you can use the RFS. I know that everybody has problems with that one, but still, nonetheless, it's the same idea. If you look at the esophagus, you can say, yes, you, you have an abnormal Z-line, but you can't say anything more than that. Yeah, it's tricky. So if you've seen your patient, you've gotten the imaging. And now you're having that discussion about treatment, about the patient who's ready to maybe do something, or maybe even the patient that's not ready to do something. I think a lot of us, we kind of know as far as, you know, surgical treatments and, you know, open and endoscopic. I guess before we get into those, is there anything to do from a non-surgical standpoint or when a patient's, you know, not ready for surgery? Is there anything that helps it not progress? Is there anything else to do? Or is it just kind of like, well, at some point we might be talking about surgery again? It's a good question. I tend to take the observation approach. I've sent some of them to like my speech pathologist too for some swallowing therapy and they said that's not really useful. So we've dabbled in it. We've tried it. I don't think it really does much. So what I'll usually do is just tell people like, hey, why don't we just have you come back in six months? Let's see how you're doing. We'll have the conversation again. And in a year, we'll repeat your imaging and see if there's any different. And so I think it'll be a really interesting cohort of patients to be able to look at, like the ones that opted not to have surgery and sort of how they change over time. Our database has been open since 2017, so we've got a good five years of data. But again, it just takes time just to, you know, first accumulate them and then kind of watch them long term. But I think it, it will depend, right? So I think observation is always an option. And that's what I tell them. You know, again, I think to get better buy-in, it's better to be honest with patients. And I tell them, I'm like, listen, this is not cancer. You don't have to have this done. And the other way that I explain my practice to patients is I tell them that I'm not a quantity of life doctor, I'm a quality of life doctor. So this is not going to extend your life, but it's going to make you enjoy eating and enjoy going out to dinner and enjoy being around company rather than becoming fearful that you're going to choke. So I think when you phrase it in that way, I think patients are a little bit more open to even when they come in thinking like, I'm just going to hear it, but I don't, you know, I'm not interested. But I think if you phrase it in a way that is more palatable, then it's an easier conversation. So I think just the surgery or not surgery, that's sort of how I think about it and how I counsel them. Yeah. And some patients need to hear it more than once and think about it a little bit longer and, you know, takes time. Do they need to be observed if a patient's like, you know what, I'm good. I'll let you know if I need you, but I'm going to go in my way. Is that okay too? Or do they need observation for any particular reason? I, again, can't say for sure, but I think it's fine. You know, and I've told patients like, hey, I'm here if you need me, right? And I've done that for a variety of different voice and swallowing disorders, not just this particular one. But yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with reaching out to their PCP and just saying like, hey, we had this conversation. They do have his anchors. It's not bothering them right now, but I would be happy to see them if it does. And I've had that happen. I've had a couple patients that have said like, oh, I'm okay. Or they have physician, children, or family members. And some of them do and some of them don't. I've had a couple that have just passed with their zankers and that's okay too. Yeah. And you basically let them know like, I guess, red flag types. You know, if you start losing weight, if you start being hospitalized for pneumonia or, you know, things that are more serious, maybe it's time to talk about this again, that sort of thing. Exactly. I even have like a dot phrase on my epic that is, you know, the red flags of dysphagia and that is you've hit them all. It's, you know, unintentional weight loss, aspiration pneumonias. And the third one that I really tell people is if you stop eating a certain type of food or if you stop like enjoying eating, then that's probably also a sign. Okay. So transitioning then to our patients who are ready, you know, I want to do something about this, you know, help me enjoy eating again. What does that conversation look like? And how do you decide who is, you know, a candidate for an endoscopic approach versus an open approach? So this is my favorite question. I just presented this data at TRIO and it is going out this weekend, actually. So we have an outcomes paper that actually looked at endoscopic versus open. And what we've found is that when you look at raw data, so if we use those EAT-10 scores, which is what we've used as an outcome marker, so in general, they all do well, right? 
But when you actually look at percent change, so one of the things that we really notice is that it's not a homogenous group. So they don't all show up with the same EAT-10 score. So in order to sort of normalize their pre-op EAT-10 score, we looked at percent change. When we look at raw data alone, then open actually does a little bit better, statistically significant between the two. But when you change it to percent change, there's no difference. So there's no difference whether you do it endoscopic or you do it open. When we look at the whole cohort, so 66% of people will do 100% better. 88% of patients will do more than 50% better on their EAT-10 scores. So what I think is fascinating about that data is, number one, as surgeons, they're not all home runs. 66 is pretty good, but they're not all home runs. And so there is definitely a tail on our histogram that there are patients that just, they don't do well, right? You know, and even 50%, I think is probably still, I mean, I, I would look for more, but that's two standard deviations. So 50% improvement in scores is still reasonable. But again, to that, you know, there's more to this disease than just the pouch. The pouch isn't the cause of dysphagia. I think they have dysphagia, then they get a pouch. So not everybody is going to get 100% improvement. So endoscopic and open, they both work. And when we look at percent change, it doesn't matter. The other, I think, hot topic, and this will be down the road, we'll certainly understand it a little bit more, but there's flexible techniques. There is the Z poems. That's another hot one now, too. And I think it'll be great to now have a number to be able to actually compare them. Because I think before, all you could do is say, oh, yeah, they're better. And that's really why I did this study was because, you know, I've challenged even my colleagues and said, well, you know, most studies, they're retrospective. And they say, okay, well, if the patients didn't come back to the office, then it must have been a success. But patients don't come back to the office also if they're pissed off. So <laughs> there's two reasons. So we can't discount the other one. <laughs> So again, mm -hmm. I mean, what the data has shown, though, is that they do do better. It's still a surgical disease. It does well. And I think a lot of it is it depends on like what tools are good in your hands. So I think this whole concept or notion of like, you know, everyone gets an open or everybody gets an endoscopic, it's null. So I think both have value. Really what this shows is surgeon preferences. But we looked between endoscopic and open. We looked at gender of patients, age of patients, size of diverticulum starting E10s, and also we looked at whether they had already had a history of recurrence. The only factor that made any difference in a surgeon's decision to do an endoscopic or an open was recurrent disease, meaning that when patients come to the office and they say, I've already had it, I've already had a zinger surgery, the tendency is then to do more opens. But that's actually, you know, counter to, there was a retrospective study, a group of four different institutions that kind of pooled all of their revision cases, and they still did more endoscopic. So again, not perfect, but I think it's very interesting that it's not as distinct as I would have thought. I would have expected that younger patients, patients with bigger diverticulums tended towards open, but it's not what we do. We do what's probably best in our hands. And you mentioned Z poems. Mm -hmm. What is that? I haven't heard of that one. So poems is a peroral submucosal resection or an endoscopic musclectomy. You're taking down the muscle. So mostly it's for like achalasia. So that's what it's really been done in. And then they've adapted the same surgical techniques to zingers, to the UEMS. It's like a submucosal tunneling. You inject some saline with some dye. It kind of opens up the space. This is all done endoscopically. And then within this like submucosal tiny little incision, then you kind of take down the muscle. It's interesting. I think flexible techniques too, or hybrid techniques, lots of people do various different hybrid approaches, right? Some staple, some laser, some flexible, some laser. I mean, there's lots and lots of different ways to skin this cat. And again, I think it'll be interesting down the road to actually be able to at least try to compare them a little bit better, especially when you can do it prospectively. Retrospectively, as I said, it's just really hard because your outcome measure to this point has been having another surgery not coming back or like a complication, right? And complications are important, but it's not an outcome measure. It's an important thing to consider. So when you're talking to patients about what type of surgery you're going to do, is it shared decision making about whether it's going to be open or endoscopic? Or do you say, you know, hey, I think in my hands, this is going to be a really great slam dunk endoscopic case? Or what does your conversation look like with them? So Ashley, my surgeon bias is young patients. So if patients are 
So definitely in their 50s or 60s is still a little bit young, not too young. But if you're in your 50s, for sure, I usually tell them I recommend an open approach. If they have a really big diverticulum, I usually recommend an open approach. So again, the three to four is kind of borderline for me. But if they're five to six, then I do. I recommend it. Five to six centimeters. Mm -hmm. Those are my own biases. Those are the ones that I tend to, to tell them to do an open and recurrent ones as well. And the rationale for that is that you just have better exposure, better ability to feel like you're kind of treating it comprehensively. Well, I think in recurrence, it just means that they've got like a different disease is sort of how I think about it. Now, one could argue, and, and certainly I've been there, that maybe, you know, especially with stapler. So it has been shown even through like meta-analyses, et cetera, that laser tends to be better than stapler, which I think makes sense just because you're going to do a longer myotomy. Sometimes those staplers, people will do all kinds of different things to figure out how to cut the end of the stapler, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes it doesn't get all the way down. So you leave a little bit of a lip of that CP. And, you know, I mean, who that's important in and who it's not. I'm not sure. It's tough to say. Again, this is what we're looking at, which is how much better should you be? But again, in my mind, I think of the recurrent patients as having a different type of disease. Yes, it's still called as anchors, but I think there's probably something else like more underlying that that caused them to have it again. That makes sense. And so I want to be able to kind of get into the nitty gritties of how you do your endoscopic approach. And so take us through everything, like maybe we'll start with the equipment that you, you know, need to have to be able to do endoscopic approach. And are you a stapler or are you a laserer? So I tell patients I do it all, which is honestly the truth. So I tell them the patient chooses the the tool, right? So I have a bunch of different ones. I'm very comfortable with using all of the different ones. So it just depends on my exposure. I think the exposure is really the key if all other things equal. When I, we have a weirda, to be honest, I don't use it very often. I usually end up using the Benjamin or we call it the slim line. It's just easier. It's gentler. It's more narrow. I think we probably cause less pharyngeal lacerations, definitely if trainees are involved, for sure. So I have both of those scopes that are available for every Zenkers that I do, but I tend to just use the slim line. I was using the weirda more for the stapler. But I've gotten away from using some of the staplers just because, again, as they've made different modifications to them, because we're using laparoscopic instruments, which are giant. They're just huge. So I think that stapler is probably safer, probably less complications when we get into the weeds of that data than we'll see. So far, even between endoscopic and open, the numbers are so small for complications that you can't even do any statistical significance of them. So yes, you do get more leaks with an open approach versus an endoscopic, but you do get crepitus. I mean, I've gotten them all. So you do a lot of surgery and you get all the complications. So those are the two rigid scopes that I use. I also always have a flexible esophagoscope available to me. I don't necessarily always use it, but I always have it available. Doesn't have to be a t and &E, could be just a pediatric gastroscope or doesn't matter. Whatever you're good with, I think it's useful. And then I have used everything from a stapler to I do like the CO2 laser. I also have used the ligature lately. I've done that a couple times as well. So I think in patients that you have to hurry up and get them off the table, right? I always send everybody to a pre-op anesthesia visit. My anesthesia colleagues are great about that. We have very good conversations about how much, how long, how quick, what risks are, are worthwhile. You know, if patients are like at a higher bleeding risk or something like that, then perhaps a stapler is fine, right? And maybe if they have a giant pouch, then a stapler will do most of it, right? If you get them better, then maybe that's okay. It doesn't have to be 100%. So I usually have all of those things together. Lately, I have been using some endoscopic suturing and some tasseal. I don't know if it makes a difference. I'm not sure. But I've been also with my lasers, when I do lasers, so smaller pouches, so less than like two centimeters, I think probably a laser is better because, again, you can't really engage the tissue, whether it's with a ligature or a stapler. So smaller pouches, I tend to use the, the CO2. The other thing that I've been doing a little bit more is I take like a piece of the muscle out. So I make a linear incision, but then sort of take that laser underneath the mucosa. So again, the same idea as this whole Z poems thing. You'd basically do like a submucosal resection of some of the muscle. And then I put a couple of stitches in. The stitches, I put them in in the inferior superior direction. I'm not sure if it makes a difference. One of my partners does it lateral, so who knows? Maybe we'll find a difference later, but I don't know. What are your settings on your CO2 laser? 
That's a good question. So I've gone back and forth between using the Accublade and using a DECA. Lately, I've been using a DECA. And I tend to do a more shallow. So I'll do a line first. I'll start on a line. I usually use a pulsed setting. And then again, I tend to go a little bit slower. So I'll use like a 0.1 and we'll do like even a depth of one, one millimeter. So I tend to go a little bit slower. The reason if you go faster, you get more bleeding. So I think when you let that tissue just cool and you just go slower, ultimately, it's kind of like a tonsil, right? You'll ultimately do better if you just like take a little bit of extra time (laughs) rather than blowing through all the muscle and then you have to go deal with all the bleeding. So yeah, I have really liked using the DECA and then I'll use it on what's called a milling setting to actually do some of this muscle ectomy, take a big chunk of the muscle out. But yeah, as soon as you start to see that buccal pharyngeal fascia, you got to slow down. Yeah, that, that's my favorite part of these cases. I feel like it's so beautiful, like when you're just like watching the fibers, you know, come apart as you're coming through with a laser. It's very elegant surgery, I feel like. It's beautiful. Yeah. So we talked about the scope. Do you ever have patients, you know, difficult exposures? Any tips for patients who might have mandibular tori or, you know, a small mandible or poor neck extension? Maybe they've been radiated for something. Like how do those types of considerations come into your thoughts about how to do the case. So I talk to patients in in advance about what do you want me to do if I can't do it endoscopic. I've done some of the hybrid flexible approaches too. Again, same thing. I think it's still good and it's good in your hands. What the flexible has shown is that people tend to have to have a couple of surgeries to be able to really get all that muscle versus, again, getting a good rigid or open exposure, then you do it in one shot. Is that good or bad? I'm not sure, but it is what we know so far. What was my question? Oh, the difficult exposures. Yeah. Yu Ma is actually just looking at this. She's using the database with me and we're looking at predictors for this. And so in the pre-op evaluation, I look for it and then we talk about what if. So what I do, because I use all kinds of different techniques, is I tell them, okay, do you want me to wake you up and do nothing? Sometimes I'll talk to them about we could do Botox and a stretch, we could do Botox and a dilation, or we could do open. If I can't expose it, you know, and I tell them, I'm like, 90% of the time, I can do the exposure. It's fine. It goes the way that we want it to. What is your preference? And again, I think it just depends on like how you frame it and who they are. Some patients are just not great candidates and they say, no, if you can't do it, you can't do it. But I would say the majority, when you kind of lay it out for them, they say, fine, just get it done. I hadn't thought about Botox. That's a good thought. So you do Botox into the CP muscle to just hopefully help that to relax so that food will go there instead of into the pouch, basically. Exactly. And again, for smaller pouches, it's reasonable. It's a reasonable option. So I think bigger pouches, you know, again, you probably won't get quite as much bang for your buck. But I think it's an easy enough one that if you can at least see your CP, but you just can't quite engage those scopes enough for like a laser or stapler or what have you, then I think Botox and a dilation are are reasonable options. And then you can always, you know, see how they do. and, And it's a minimal risk. Do you have any preference on the size of the tube as far as like the tube that anesthesia uses? I assume if you're going to use a laser, you use a laser tube. Do you care what size it is or any preference on that? I don't think it matters too much. I mean, I tend to, and my anesthesiologist just know that I tend to use smaller tubes. You know, we don't ever use anything bigger than a six and a half. Five O's like my go-to, but I don't think it probably doesn't really make a huge difference as far as like exposures and things like that. I don't think it matters. Again, I tend to go smaller, and that's just because, honestly, Ashley, I had, I think it was probably my first year, I was doing an esophageal, it was just a dilation on a head and neck patient, and anesthesia was intubating. She got a hemorrhage, and so then she got a bruise on her vocal cord, which was fine. It always comes back, you know, it's all fine. But but the patient was so bummed that, like, she went in for her swallowing, then came out hoarse, and, you know, one of my anesthesiologists said, why don't you just do all your own intubations? I said, okay. Fine. So that's what I do. So, <laughs> And that was that. <laughs> that was the end of that. So I do all my own intubations. So I pick my own tubes and tell them what, you know, what I'm going to yeah, use. So. <laughs> I love it. That's great. <laughs> so you've done your laser, um, or I assume we're talking about the laser patient. So you have the endoscopic suture that kind of passes that needle back and forth through the tissue, right? How many stitches do you need to do? How many passes? One good one is usually enough. If you still see like a hole or something, then I'll put two. And then I use to seal. Again, I can't tell you that any of it necessarily is necessary, but it makes me sleep better at night. So, And any tips on how do you tie that knot? Do you have like a knot pusher or 
I don't end up using a knot pusher. I actually end up, we just do hand ties and then it's a really good and humbling experience for my residents, especially, right? I tie the knot outside the scope and then usually I just use like an alligator. Trick is just lubing it up. So putting a lot of either ointment or lube on both your stitch and on your alligator and then you just push that knot down. It usually works a little bit easier because otherwise you have to thread the needle through those knot pushers and like you just spend so much time doing it. So I tend to skip it just because it takes forever. Yeah. How many knots do you throw? Three. As long as it's staying down again, then I think it's okay. And I, I used to not do it at all. But when I started to get a little bit more aggressive with taking more muscle, that's really when I started to do the stitch with it. So the stitch kind of comes across where that defect is to help that close a little bit better. Just keeps your mucosa together. So, And this is all trends. We're going to present this data um, at COSM. It's how I do it. But I keep people overnight. So regardless, whether they're endoscopic or open, I treat them the exact same. So they get ice chips for post-op day zero. And then in the morning, if, you know, no crepitus, nothing else is going on, then they get liquids in the morning and then they get soft foods for lunch. And if they're still good, then they get to go home the same day. If they have an open approach, if they've met all those metrics, then we take the drain out right before discharge. I don't do a swallowing test just to check. I don't do it if they have a leak and I think that they have a leak. So I'll even, I'll just keep them NPO for an extra day or two first. If it's still concerning, then I'll get the swallow test. So most patients, if everything goes according to plan, they're going home the next day. So they're basically staying overnight, 23-hour OBS. Once they go home, are they free to eat whatever they want? Or do you keep them on, you know, a more restricted diet for a certain amount of time? I tell them to do a soft diet for two weeks. So I tell them, you know, whatever you were eating before is probably okay. Things that were getting stuck before, don't try them in, in the first two weeks. I'll often tell them, okay, cooked carrots are fine. Raw carrots, probably too much. You know, fried chicken, we're close to Kentucky. Don't do it. Shredded chicken, <laughs> fine. So <laughs> so those are sort of my criteria. Ground meat, okay. Don't go get a steak. <laughs> or at least not a cheap one. <laughs> and what red flags are you telling them to look for? You know, like if this or this happens, you need to call me. What What's that conversation go like? You know, Ashley, I don't even have it. So once they get out of my 23-hour window, because that's what I tell them, like my complications, I think I've had one guy come back that ended up having, I mean, it was just a wound infection. He had an open approach and had like a delayed wound infection. But, you know, knock on wood, if they get out of that first 24 hours, it's going to declare it right away. So I don't even bother having that conversation with them. Don't even put that in the I don't, out into the universe, no, right? I don't, just, <laughs> I don't. I don't even. Ta- I just. I tell them like, you make it through my criteria, you're good. By the next day, like you can go and you're fine. So, so far so good. Knock on wood. Yeah. So the patients that are going to have trouble have it in that first 24 hours is what you usually see. They do. They have. In my experience, yes. Um, and as I said, we're actually we're looking at the data now to see like what does everybody else do? What does it look like? Like what should we be doing rather than me just saying like this is how I do it. Which is, you know, let's be honest, that's a lot of like otolaryngology training to this point. Yeah. So as far as getting into the complications of the bad things that can happen, what do you counsel patients on, you know, as far as what can happen in that first 24 hours after surgery? So I tell all of them, I am, you know, intentionally cutting your esophagus. So a hole in the esophagus, that's the biggest one. That's what I'm watching for. That is the complication that I'm looking for. And I tell them usually it presents with you have some swelling of your neck. It's sometimes air gets in. So I said, we're going to push on your neck for the next 24 hours. And so just palpating for crepitus is really what what I end up doing. The drain for the open folks, I just make sure that it's serosanguinous. And again, that comes out right at the end because it's also there for a leak. It's not just there for a seroma or hematoma, but it's really there in case they have a leak because then you just have to wait, which is incredibly painful and nobody wants to do it. But at least you already have your drain there. It's already done. You just have to give them some time. And for your patients who you do feel some crepitus, you tell them we're not going to eat anything for a little while. What do you do next? I usually give them an extra day. So I give them one more day, give them one more day of NPO. Completely NPO? Yeah. So again, if they have crepitus like in the morning, they don't get started on any of the diet. If they started a diet, we stop their diet. We make them NPO. So I make them NPO for usually one to two days and then see if it resolves, if like the crepitus resolves and it goes away, then we restart. So then I do the liquids in the morning, we do the soft foods at night. I would say if it's more than two days that they're still having fluorid crepitus, then just wait. Plus or minus a swallow test, although you already know they have a leak. But 
I think they probably do need an alternative source of nutrition. You know, if they're open, they have a drain. Even if it's endoscopic, it depends, right? If their neck doesn't look infected, they just have the leak. Because you can have a clean leak, a hole, but it's not causing an infection. And in those cases, then they just, they need an NG tube. Sometimes that's a little tricky though, because again, whether you put it in, I mean, and I've done both. Sometimes our folks will do it. We could do it under fluoro or we do it like in the OR and just go do it and put it in just to, again, make sure you're not going through the hole, right? You don't want your NG tube going into the mediastinum. Yeah. Does it just depend on how big the incision was? You know, your decision to put it in like under direct visualization versus letting somebody else do it? I think it just depends. I think it depends on your situation, right? How much do you trust your institution and your colleagues to be able to do it like under fluoro or under IR versus like just doing it yourself? I think it really depends. And it depends on the patient. I mean, if they look like they've got an infection, that's different, right? You're going to go wash them out anyways. So you're going to wash them out. So you might as well just put the NG tube in yourself. I think that the clinical dilemma is those patients that they don't have an infection yet. I do put them on antibiotics, though. Does everybody get antibiotics or only if they have crepitus? So my open patients, I'll give them three doses while they have a drain. And as soon as the drain comes out, they're done. My endos and opens both get a periop, you know, a pre-incision dose of antibiotics, and that's it. So I don't give them any, anything prophylactic, but if I really think there's a leak or if we've proven that there's a leak, then they're on antibiotics. Do you have an antibiotic of choice? I usually do Unison or Clinda, one of the two of those. And then we just wait. And, you know, I mean, again, if they've got like a florid leak, like you haven't been able to resolve it quickly within those first couple of days, because usually that's just like a pinhole and that'll close up pretty well and easily on their own. But if they've got like a big defect and I've had them, it happens then you're better off just like giving them two weeks rest. So put a feeding tube in, let them sit, you know, hold their hand through it, but like don't test them, don't do anything, just give it two weeks and then test them and see. And and I usually just send them for a uh, leak test. So I'll send them for a leak test, see how they do, and then go from, it's incredibly defeating, but. Yes, yeah. (laughs) Well, this this has been really fantastic, really comprehensive talk about Zinker's diverticulum. Any final pearls or parting words, anything to leave our listeners with, anything that I have failed to ask about that you feel like is important for people to know? No, Ashley, I think I've I've given you all my tips, tricks, pearls, and um, questions for the future. So (laughs) more to come. It's been a ton of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, awesome. And if people want to find you or learn more about you, uh, any, you know, um, websites or social media or anywhere to send them to? We uh, we are on Instagram. We've got an Instagram account that's uh, UC Voice and Swallow. I am on LinkedIn as well. Otherwise, I will tell you, I'm not a great social media person. Yeah, I'm not so great at it <laughs> either, but. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks again for taking the time. It was great. Appreciate it. Wonderful. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor Spurgeon Hess and Yvonne Orvijinsky. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.